in half an hour a chance to see highlights from last night's questions. Now Sarah Kennedy and guests discuss the stories behind the news in daytime. <laughs> And welcome to another week of daytime programs. Well, six months ago on this program, an AIDS victim spoke on the television for the first time about the disease. AIDS is rarely out of the newspapers, what the government is doing or not doing, or we you and are at Linda Evans having kissed Rock Hudson, and the Sunday papers called Gay Town San Francisco, the city in fear. But after all, it is rather remote, isn't it? AIDS was something that happened to certain groups of people, and it was unlikely to affect us on a daily basis. Well, that was until this couple from Chandler's Ford near Winchester discovered their son, a haemophiliac, had developed antibodies to AIDS through a factor VIII injection, which helps blood to clot. Well, what were they to do? Because Peter is nine, and of course, he goes to school. Norman and Doyne, thank you very much for joining us. Doyne, first of all, when the doctor told you that Peter had developed antibodies, you must have gone home and thought about what to do. Now, why did you decide to tell anyone? We decided that we must tell the school because we had been told that we must be careful with Peter's blood. Um, so, so as um, other children wouldn't um, be involved in looking after Peter if he did fall down and have a blood spillage, we felt that the school must know so they could take simple precautions and an adult could deal with the, the problem. Okay. Norma, we hear today that 90 parents of haemophiliacs in Birmingham have decided not only to tell the children, but they don't want to be told themselves. Now, why have you done something completely different? Why have you come out? In fact, Peter has become a test case. I think you've got to remember, of course, that uh, the parents of haemophiliacs are pe our people as well, and uh, indeed they're likely to be just as frightened as any other person. Uh, personally, ourselves, I think uh, we've always believed uh, that you can't uh, overcome a problem by running away from it, and this is our way of handling it. Do you regret having told everyone? Because, I mean, you have brought down on your media circus, haven't you? Well, uh, yes, we have. Uh, no, we don't regret at all. Uh, it was an automatic reaction. It started very simply and obviously mushroomed from there. But, uh, no, if it does, if it brings it out into the open and does some good, then it will, will definitely have been worthwhile. Mm. But some parents have withdrawn their children from the school. Now, I'd like to introduce you now at home to Dr. Anthony Pinching. You're one of the country's experts on AIDS. You went down as well to help uh, Doreen and Norman and explain to the, the parents that there wasn't anything to worry about and you're going to do that for us today on daytime. Is a child or a teacher for that matter who comes into association with Peter at that school, is that person in any danger at all of getting AIDS? The short answer is no. Um, I think the public perception of this disease uh, has been very much flavoured by some of the sensational and hysterical headlines that we had earlier in the year. Um, and people have got the view, quite wrongly, that this is a very contagious disease. Um, and what we really need to do, and what in the way I had to do the other day, was simply to put the straightforward scientific facts about this disease, the way in which the virus is transmitted, which is really only in very particular settings, and then to allow people really to make up their own minds. I think uh, the press really haven't given people the opportunity to look at the, proper, the issue properly. Well, we can also, it, I totally take your point about the press, but obviously if nurses and dentists and ambulance men, they're obviously worried and, and refusing to treat AIDS victims, it, obviously it's that people are worried and that's quite natural. Now let's get down to what the point that Doreen was making. If a child is in the playground, it falls over, it bleeds. We know that AIDS can be transmitted through blood. Now, is there any danger there? Because Peter is at the school with two minders. Could it happen? Clearly, any child who's leading the life of a normal school kid may have an accident. My, my kid had a, a fall the other day and bled. Uh, it's, it's bound to happen. But there are certain simple, basic, common sense measures one takes with blood spillage in any setting, with basic hygiene and common sense. There really is no problem. You would clearly clean up a spillage of blood with some caution. If there was a known instance where there was somebody who carried a virus in the blood, then you might additionally use bleach or whatever to disinfect the blood before cleaning it up. These are the sort of basic measures we use in counselling individuals and patients and indeed 
uh, a child of nine is very uh, able to look after this issue himself. We are talking about large amounts of blood, aren't we? We're not yes. talking about scratches, for example. I mean, I think we're, we're dealing with a sort of, in a way, a belt and braces policy, because I think mm -hmm. the sort of amounts of blood that you're dealing with in the sort of playground setting or community setting uh, in general is not the sort of thing that is likely to transmit this virus. There is no evidence that it has ever done so, because it does require very intimate contact of blood, and really the blood not only has to be uh, from the person, but directly into the blood of another person, okay. and that just doesn't happen. Kids hit each other, they also kiss each other. Now, we, we believe that uh, AIDS can be transferred through kissing. Well, in which case you believe wrong. There is no evidence that the virus can be transmitted uh, by kissing, and certainly uh, uh, there have been enough of people who would carry this virus in which that hypothesis, if you like, has been tested. There is no it's evidence. It's carried in saliva, though, isn't it? Well, there's a very different, it's a very different thing to say that you can find the virus in saliva when you've cultured it in the laboratory for six weeks and given it some all uh, long-sounding names to, to beef it up and persuade the virus to come out of the cells in which it's latent and to be measurable. That is not the same as saying that it is transmitted from one person to another by that route. Okay. And, uh, that's Chewing what, pencils? Things like that? Well, I mean, if you like chewing pencils, uh, then probably... I don't, uh, Anthony, but <laughs> a nine-year-old might. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think there's no evidence that the virus can be transmitted by that route, no scenario which you could really imagine that it would be. I think if you were going to chew your pencil, you wouldn't give that pencil to somebody else to chew immediately afterwards. A nine-year-old Basic might. hygiene, <laughs> basic hygiene uh, should operate in, even in schools. Swimming pools are a great one. In fact, somebody I met came back from San Francisco the other day and said to me, the first thing everyone said to him, don't go in a swimming pool in San Francisco. I think it's just silly. I mean, there is no reason to, to fear a swimming pool. The most swimming pools are very adequately chlorinated. It would kill uh, not only this virus, but a lot of other things, and makes one makes one's eyes pretty sore anyway. So uh, there are plenty of things that will inactivate. But, of course, the biggest uh, effect in a swimming pool, or indeed running water, is uh, the dilution effect. And that if there is any virus around, it is diluted enormously. And we're dealing with tiny quantities of virus. All right. One more question, and then I'd like to go to the audience. Peter, as I said, is not alone. There are 850, I think, uh, haemophiliac boys in this country. 500 definitely will have got antibodies like Peter. They're in schools around Britain. How long do parents like Doreen and Norman have to wait before they find out whether Peter will develop, the antibodies will develop into AIDS? Well, that's something where you're asking me to be a prophet, and that's one thing that I, uh, I don't think I should try to be. The evidence we have at the moment suggests that uh, only a minority of individuals who have met this virus and have developed antibodies as a marker for having met it uh, will develop AIDS. The evidence at the moment would suggest that the percentage is, uh, is 1 to perhaps 5%. 5% um, would, would get... Would ultimately develop AIDS. But I think when? that's a provisional figure, and they're talking about over a period of four to five years. Four to five years. But and does uh, that mean that Peter and, the, and other haemophiliac balls will be regularly tested? Indeed. I mean, like any other clinical condition, uh, the medical profession is in the business of making sure that everything is done to detect uh, progression of disease early and indeed uh, do our utmost to prevent that by whatever means is available. Fine. Now, we believe you. You're a medical man. You're sitting there in the suit and you, you know what you're talking about. <laughs> the problem is, do we really believe you? Do we believe you enough <laughs> that we will put our children into a school with a haemophiliac carrying antibodies to, to AIDS? Let me ask. What, do, have you got children? Yes, I've got three children, one that's in school. Um, I would be quite prepared to send my child to school with a um, haemophiliac child that was there if I had all the answers to all the questions, um, some things that haven't been answered yet. If it's going to take four or five years for the antibodies to be converted into a disease in some children, how can you be so confident that if you've only been studying disease for a year or two that... Um, Kissing, for instance, won't produce antibodies in other children in about six years. A very good point. We were told that we could look at nuclear tests, and now we know differently. If you look back at a rerun of this program in ten years, would you perhaps think, oh, Lord, I said that about swimming pools. I've been proven wrong in time. Well, I think uh, one has to be honest about this. There are clearly issues that we don't know about, which we're still researching on, um, and uh, there's no question that that is the case. And the things that turn... Uh, symptom-free infection into disease is, is one of the areas that we need to examine. But I think when we're talking about transmission events, about the number of settings in which we've had the opportunity to examine whether the disease is transmitted in one setting or another, then when you're dealing with what something like 15 or 16,000 cases of AIDS worldwide and perhaps anything between 10 and 20 times that number of people who carry the virus, 
then we've had a lot of opportunity to examine potential transmission settings. And I think that, therefore, the data we have on that is really very extensive and enables us to make comparisons with the sort of risks we take every day with our children, like walking them across the road, putting them in the back of our car. Do we put seat straps on them? That sort of question that uh, we always have to think about our child. There's no absolute guarantee, but we're talking about You're very, very low levels of risk. You're fairly confident. Okay. You weren't confident, were you, right at the beginning? You, you have a child at uh, Chandler's Ford. It's the microphone's actually now. What were your major worries? Um, I think it was just the fear of the unknown, really. Um, you withdrew your childhood? Both of them, yes. We have two children at Scandalbout, and we withdrew both of them. Um, the meeting that we had on the Friday, we weren't very happy about what we heard there. And it was just the fear of the unknown. What did they tell you then on Friday? Not very much at all, actually. Um, I don't think enough, anyway. Uh, the meeting on Wednesday was far better, and we felt a lot happier about letting our children go back. We still have the niggle, we still have the doubt. I think we always will. But we do feel a lot happier about it now. Have you any alternative? Um, other than changing the school, I mean, what alternative do we have? We weren't given any alternative other than changing the schools, which we didn't want to do. Academically, Scandibat's a lovely school. It's a very good school. Thank you very much. What about you? Well, my children have been at school for the whole time. Um, I was in a slightly advantageous position in as much as I work at the school. And we had, there was a meeting of the staff. I work in the kitchens, and we were told of the situation. So when we had the meeting on the Wednesday, I was already forewarned. But even then, I was quite happy to send my children to school. Are you 100% happy? Yes, I think so. I mean, perhaps 99 you know, I am quite happy with the situation. I feel that the precautions that have been taken at school are perfectly adequate. The child is minded the whole time. Um, and I, as far as I'm concerned, rather the devil you know than the devil you don't. Thank you. Absolutely. <laughs> this, is, this is where you have a, a haemophiliac child, and it does seem that they are completely innocent victims of this. How, is, how, um, how do you look after a haemophiliac child when, the, when this is going on? Well, we've, um, since we found out that he was haemophiliac, we've always been told to treat him exactly the same as everybody else. Can you do this now? now? This has become so public. Well, it's become more difficult, yes, of course it has. In yes. what ways? Um, I think just through... Um, you know, media pressure, really. It's become much more difficult to look at him normally. But, but you, you say media pressure, but what, I mean, what do you mean by that? Well, we get a lot of information um, through society and from the doctors. We're lucky, we have all this information, therefore we don't worry. But other people who don't get all this information, like grandparents, for instance, um, they phone up and they say, we're worried, you know. So we're lucky, really, because we have all the information. We have a, very good backing from, from doctors and um, Ignorance other people is don't. not bliss. No. Thank you. You, it landed up on, on your desk. This is uh, John Slade, the Area Education Authority officer in uh, Hampshire. Did you know what to do? We had no guidelines and therefore we had to consider, first of all, what evidence we could get, what the accurate medical opinion was. We had obviously some knowledge because we were aware that this was going to happen somewhere sometime. But what have you learned from it? I think the most important thing I've learned from it is the large amount of work which has been done in respect of AIDS and therefore the much better medical evidence there is than I suspected existed when I started. Interesting. Norman and Doreen, how much guidance did you get? Were you just left in the air or, or were you fully told what to do and what to expect? We weren't told to do anything very much. We were basically told we didn't really need to go away and tell anyone, although we did bring up the point about we felt the school should know, but it was left entirely up to us. So really, we weren't told anything that we must do. We, we, we were obviously told about uh, being a bit more careful with spillages of blood, particularly as we inject him at home, uh, being careful of um, sticking, accidentally sticking the needle in your own hand. Um, and really, that's, I think, pretty much where it stopped. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Let me come to the haemophiliac society. Not that you're, you more act as you will operate from the haemophiliac centre in Southampton. Now, one thing that has come up, and I keep saying innocent victims, but these children have been injected with factor eight that has been infected. Is that, has that stopped? Yes, as of the 1st of April this year, 
olfactorate concentrates used to treat children with hemophilia are being heat treated before and that inactivates the virus so it can no longer be infective in, in that way. So no one will be infected again from factory? Not in that way and all the blood that is used to make the factory concentrates is pre-tested for the presence of the TLV3 antibody and it's all known to be negative. And the same process is going on now with all fresh blood that's been used. Is that blood donors as well? All blood donors are being tested, and this will be national policy from the, beginning, from the middle of this coming month, but in fact it's going on already. Can gay people still give blood? No, they, they are being asked not to. Obviously someone who is gay could uh, come give blood if, if they wish to do so, but they're not a, they're, there's no law that can prevent them, but they're all being asked not to, to give blood. Okay. And I'm sure the responsible would not wish to Absolutely. do Absolutely. John Prothero, you're the treasurer of the Haemophiliac right. Society and you're a haemophiliac, well, I can't even say <laughs> haemophiliac yourself. <laughs> now in the papers today we hear that the Haemophiliac Society has said don't tell anyone unless it's the doctor and the headmaster. Do you think that is right? Yes, I think so because it's, it's the hysterical response that sort of just the mention of AIDS has produced um, far and way outweighs any benefit that uh, expressing it on a, on a wider scale is going to have. But we can't put our heads in the sand, can we? What happens when those haemophiliacs get to 16 and they're having sexual intercourse? If they don't know and then the person they're doing it with doesn't know, we're all going to be in a mess, aren't we? The, I think the haemophiliac himself should know. Um, I know there are some haemophiliacs who've asked not to be told, but what our advice to those that have told, asked not to be told is that they should in fact act as though they have the, the antibody in their blood. I mean, they may be perfectly happy in their own mind that, that they haven't got it, but we advise them most strongly that they should act as though they do have. Right. Thank you. Norman and Dorian again. Where did you get the most animosity, the most problems from? Was it parents or? Not directly, no. Um, obviously parents were worried, but not at any time has anyone come along and being nasty to us at all. Has anyone said, I don't want to have uh, Peter anywhere near me or, or you because he could kiss you and then No. No one no, at all? Not no. even your dentist? Oh. Well, we... <laughs> we got we, him. <laughs> <laughs> you made me say it now. And I, I hate dentists. <laughs> but what, did, what happened with the dentist? Well, the, the reason why we sort of forgotten him, obviously, it was just another problem. <laughs> um, the... As well as telling the, the school, uh, because of the very slight risk of, risk of infection uh, through saliva, we, hopefully being responsible, we told the dentist as well. And uh, we fully expected that the dentist would say, well, we won't treat Peter. Uh, not too much of a problem, because for any significant treatment, Peter would have to be treated in hospital anyway. Uh, so, and indeed, he said that, I don't want, wish to treat Peter. We got home, and uh, then we had a phone call saying, I don't wish to treat you or your wife or your child. Uh, at which point we sort of wondered whether the milkman ought to be um, <laughs> go to that dentist. One of the worst the... sides of telling. Mm. Anthony, what do you think about that? Well, um, it's not a unique experience, but I don't think it's acceptable, frankly. Um, there is perfectly adequate guidance to dentists from uh, the Department of Health some years back about uh, guidance for handling people who have the hepatitis B virus, which is transmitted in a very similar way. There are well laid down guidelines for handling this in the dental practice. There is a Department of Health advisory committee on dentists, and surgery and, and other problems, and they have given very clear guidance which really would enable a, uh, a perfectly ordinarily equipped dental practice to cope with this problem. Thank you very much. Tom Dahl, come on, you've got a bat for the dentists now. They're getting a well, very you, bad name. You, you've, you, you, you've really bowled a fast on at me, haven't you? Frankly, I am appalled to hear of the experience that they've had in this particular case. I agree entirely with what uh, Dr. Pincher has said, that it is quite possible for a dentist to provide treatment for an HTLV3 antibody positive patient. It is essential that he is told uh, and this is most important, and in the counselling which is given to haemophiliacs, uh, I think it is very important indeed that the dentists are amongst the groups of people who should be informed. Now, uh, it doesn't surprise me if there are some cases where there's still a lack of knowledge and misunderstanding. After all, it is a fairly new situation. But dentists have guidelines, they're professional people the, with a very heavy medical background. I agree with you entirely, and I think both the Department of Health and ourselves have a major educational job to do, uh, and as far as the British Dental Association is concerned, that is just what we are uh, uh, intending to do over the next month or two. And we Why would... hasn't it been done sooner? 
Why hasn't it been done? I don't think we were necessarily aware that there was going to be a, a problem. I, well, I agree AIDS with developed Dr. developed in 1979 no. in America. No, no, I'm sorry. Five years ago. Guidelines have been available with respect to hepatitis B. Uh, we have put out information through our journal uh, and other sources uh, that patients who have the, uh, this particular uh, antibody should be treated in the same way as hepatitis B uh, patients. So dentists should certainly and treat And that message doesn't seem to have got through as well as it should have done, so we need to redouble our efforts, <laughs> and that's what we're doing. Tom, thank you. Sorry to lumber you with that one. Let's ask about nurses, because guidelines seems to be the thing. Nurses, what do you feel? Did you have guidelines on AIDS? Well, the Royal College of Nursing in February produced their guidelines for care for patients with AIDS. And because February this year? February this year. And because information is growing all the time, it's produced in a sort of um, format so that they can be added on as we know about it. And obviously the area of children is an area that we are looking at specifically now, having given generalised guidelines. Nurses have criticised themselves in, in, in that guideline book there, saying that nurses, I'm putting it in layman's language, yes. frighten, and therefore they're not giving the social, psychosocial support to patients. Is anything being done to help that? Hopefully um, we are doing that. I think we come with all the professionals and other people as well. It seems the information, the education side, the parents were frightened, both the parents of children with haemophilia and parents at school, because they don't know enough information. You'd have liked guidelines earlier. Well, yes. Thank you very much. What about the ambulance men? Dr. Dennis Doyle, you're batting for them. Have they got sufficient guidelines? Uh, yes, indeed. Um, the ambulance service has had established um, procedures for handling all infectious disease for quite some time. At the outbreak of the epidemic, shall we say, in um, the UK, we sought guidance from a number of bodies, including DHSS and the British Society for the Study of Infection. And we have an established procedure which probably does not meet the needs at the present time because... It's overreaction, isn't it? In a sense, it could be classified as such. I think the problem is the diagnostic label. What, what is a good... What is AIDS? What is AIDS with a risk to uh, an ambulance man? Um, and I think we're looking at that with a view to um, re Updating refining that. the information that is made available to the con control staff who request the ambulances. Dennis, the ambulances. thank you very much. Can, Can I just I... make one point? Yes, certainly. Please. I do want to go to the audience, though, very quickly. You, d you did say that am ambulance men refuse to have refused to treat AIDS in patients. That is not the case, certainly, in the London mm -hmm. when I Did did I, I say that? You, I thought Don't you did. Don't think I did. Right. Don't think well, I did. apologies if, if I'm If I did, I didn't mean it. Okay. Ladies and gentlemen, we've got about four minutes left. What questions would you like to ask? I'd this like to the ambulance man. What would he do in a situation if he was put with a man with AIDS or a woman with AIDS? And what would he do if he had to give the kiss a life? <laughs> All right, that's an interesting one. He is not an ambulance man, he's a doctor advising, but go on then, Dennis. Thank you. I will certainly take that. I think most amb ambulance men would resuscitate the patient with a resuscitation aid that is available on all amb ambulances. And indeed, I know certainly of one case where an AIDS patient was resuscitated uh, by the com conventional kiss of life. I think unhesitatingly the staff of the London Ambulance Service would react accordingly. Okay, thank you very much. Lady behind. I'd just like to ask Doreen and Norman, how long is it since you were aware of the fact, the fact that your son was a, an AIDS carrier? We were told at the end of May. The end of May. Yes. So the media have really just got a hold of it now and the panic started. You know more about this than I do. Well, well we knew at the end of May and uh, we told the school a couple of days later. Um, then, obviously, the, the headmaster had to find out information himself. He didn't know uh, what to do, so there was a delay while he found out things. Then, of course, the school holidays came uh, into uh, play, so it was really only at the beginning of this new school term when the very first uh, meeting between the parents took place. That when the parents were told. That's, that's right, yes. Right. You're that obviously not happy there. about... Uh, thank you, we're running out. <laughs> One quickie. I want to ask when there's going to be a cure or inoculation. A very good point, and I was going to ask just that as well. When is well, there going to be a cure? We know a lot about the disease, how the virus acts against the immune system. So although we're not yet saying we have cures at the moment, we have the knowledge, which I think is the foundation for, for seeking those, those in the coming years. I think inoculation, when you're talking about preventative vaccines, that is much further away, but of course there's lots more prevention we can do now in terms of people modifying their lifestyles to reduce the spread of this disease. We don't, don't want to wait for the pill for every ill uh, before you do some action. You're talking prevention. about grown-ups being less promiscuous. 
I think just taking very sensible measures about their sexual activity. Okay, thank you very much. Let's bring it back to children. Have you a message for people watching who may be worried? I think if, if they can get as much information as they can, that's got to be the, the, the first step towards taking away the fear. That's really what it is, yes. Get it's, it's de yeah. Deal with the fear. And where would you tell people to get information, Anthony? Well, um, I have to say that you have to look at to the quality press and perhaps uh, certain selected television programmes. Like ours. Um, <laughs> and I hope it will improve, but we can't afford to believe everything that you read in the press. Thank you. I think that's a very good point at which to end today's programme. It's the end of today's, anyway, on Thursday. A complete change of tack. We always have to do this at the end of the programme, don't we? Where do we dump our nuclear waste? Four places in Britain are being earmarked. Four communities are protesting. Dump, yes, but not in my backyard. Well, that's on Thursday. But for now, from all our guests and my Adrian Mole socks, goodbye. <laughs> If you'd like to take part in the daytime audience, the number to ring is 01 484 2345. The lines are open now and will remain open until 4 p.m. Body Mist 2 is working even harder to help keep you drier. Now you can stand even closer with new, harder working Body Mist 2. I want it. On TV AM, tomorrow, take a spectacular look behind the scenes of the movie world when we eavesdrop on the filming of Death Wish 3 and talk to director Michael Winner. We also talk to Twiggy about the changes in her life since the swinging 60s and Harry Seacombe tells of his travels down life's highway. We investigate claims that doctors are now too busy to care properly for the elderly. And on the opening day of their largest shop, we ask, what's in store for the Laura Ashley Empire? So join Anne Diamond and Henry Kelly tomorrow on TV AM.